next speaker comes to us from Los Angeles by way of UK and a variety of other places. Uh, please join me in welcoming this wonderful performer to our stage, Ms. Jean Morton. Thank you very much. Howdy. It works with an English accent too, that's good. So we're talking here about the triple threat performer. What's a triple threat? So a triple threat performer is someone who can equally dance, sing, and act. So the kind of three prongs that are required for a Broadway show. And people would always say to me, I, I lived in that world for a long time and I now train people to do it. And People often say, how do you do that? How do you sing and dance at the same time? And the answer is, it is pretty hard. Um, so some of the things these uh, uh, performers are required to do, you know, they might be at that top of that big leap and they've got to hit a top B flat vocally. They might be being held upside down in a partnered lift. They might be being thrown across the stage on a flying harness. So the physiological requirements are quite great. And, and the question is, are we training them for the job? And traditionally, most of the training has been quite polarized, so people do their dance training, and they do their voice training, but nobody really looks at how do we integrate those things. And when you look at the training for, for dancing and the training for vocalizing, there are a lot of incompatibilities in terms of muscle recruitment patterns, body alignment, and this is why it can sometimes be less about triple threat and more double trouble. Um, so it's something that I struggle with. I was a classical ballet dancer who came into musical theatre and was suddenly have to sing, having to sing when I'm moving and uh, started to struggle with a lot of issues. So when we look at the training, anybody who's a Broadway dancer is likely to have a very, very strong high standard of training and that's likely to have included quite a lot of classical ballet. It's often where dancers start and even though the musical theatre realm is much more about kind of jazz movements, they are likely to still be taking ballet class and a lot of their, their training is rooted in that. And it's really in the classical ballet technique that we see a lot of the discrepancies that start to cause trouble when you try and vocalize at the same time. So that's what we're going to just sort of have a little look at today, uh, just a couple of these aspects to illustrate this point. Now, one of the features of, of classical ballet training is, is if, you, if you look at a dancer, they often have a very high eye line and a high chin line. So they're playing up this way all the time. So what they're doing is actually displacing the chin away from the sternum. So they're altering that relationship. And if we think of where the vocal apparatus sits, which is in this highly mobile region in the neck, the muscles that, that operate the vocal mechanism that attach to the hyoid bone and the larynx um, are very small muscles, and as soon as you start to lift up like this, you're going to put them on stretch, and they start to become less efficient at doing their job. If we think about the airway that's coming up from the lungs, obviously uh, singing is controlling airflow. Um, if you start lifting that chin up too much, you're going to start putting a kink in the pipe, and, and it's going to affect your breath flow. Um, so this is a, a slide that kind of illustrates that. That top uh, row is our, our classical dancers with their chins held high, and lower down, we've got our singers straight out, everything in alignment and very direct in their eye line. So that's just one aspect of sort of body alignment that, that um, is, is a, a marked difference. The other thing to look at is how do we achieve um, good vocal mechanics. So if anyone's been to a Broadway show in recent years, you probably noticed they're getting very loud and they're getting very high in pitch as well. So there's this kind of trend now for this high belt sound uh, in a lot of shows, particularly in the more sort of modern rock shows. And how do we actually safely achieve that? Well, that is a function of something called subglottal pressure, which we will pick apart. So this is just a really good analogy, the garden hose, right? If you think of the stream of water as being the stream of air uh, upon which you are vocalizing. Vocalization is basically controlled exhalation. So if we have that airflow coming out, then um, if we want to increase our volume or if we want to increase our pitch and get higher in pitch, we need good subglottal pressure. Now, the glottis is formed by the, it's the, a valve, basically, that's formed by the vocal cords that sit within our larynx, which is uh, the Adam's apple here. So within that, we have our vocal cords. As the air is coming up the airway, it causes those vo uh, vocal, cords, vocal cords to vibrate 
and they make a buzzing sound. If you ever, as a kid, split a blade of grass and blew through it, and you get that little buzz, you're making those surfaces oscillate. Essentially, the voice is a reed instrument. We are all reed instruments. And it's, so at the, the level of the larynx, it's just a buzz, and then the shape of our, our vocal tract above it shapes it into the sounds that we hear. So what we need to, to get that volume and pitch is a good amount of air pressure beneath the level of the glottis. Now, if we use that garden hose analogy, which I stole from a very good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Kenneth Tom, who's a speech and language pathologist who works with singers, um, it just really illustrates the point quite well. So if I want to increase my volume, i.e. with my garden hose, I want to water the bit of lawn over there, but I've got no more length of hose, I have two options. I can go and turn up the faucet, increase the pressure, and the water will throw a little bit further. My other option is, stick the finger over the end, squirt it. Yeah? So you use constriction to get that increase in pressure. The same is true of vocalizing. So I can give myself a nice tank of air, and I can get louder, and I can get higher in quite an open sound. So it's quite a clean, open sound, hopefully. If I use constriction, I can get the same effect, but I'm going to squeeze this way, and I can get higher and, and louder that way. But you can hear that's probably not a very nice sound on the ear, but it's also not very healthy. So this is going to lead us into the territory of vocal fatigue, strain of the vocal musculature, potentially rate issues with, trying to, uh, with actually being able to achieve higher pitches. And in, in extreme cases, they can actually get damage to the vocal folds as well. So we're seeing vocal injury as a result of reduced subglottal pressure. So why do we have reduced subglottal pressure in our dancers, particularly? And it comes down to breath mechanics and what dancers are doing or not doing with their breath. So very basic respiratory uh, um, anatomy. Obviously, there are many, many muscles involved in breath, but these are just the two I've just sort of cherry-picked for, for the, these purposes. Muscle of inhalation, the diaphragm, of course, that dome structure in the middle of the body. As we take an in-breath, it flattens, contracts and flattens downwards. So the top of that dome is going to flatten downwards. Obviously, underneath that, we've got quite a lot of stuff. Yeah? There's a lot of internal organs beneath there. They need to get out of the way in order for the diaphragm to make its full journey downwards. That's the only way we're going to get a full tank of air. So in order for that to happen, we need to release the abdomen. So we expand the uh, abdominal wall to allow for that um, a, a change in shape, and then as we exhale, the transversus abdominis, the deepest layer of our abdominal wall, is going to contract and return those organs back to their neutral position and help with the recoil of the diaphragm and the expulsion of the air. So when we look at how dancers are trained, and if anybody ever went to ballet classes when they were a little kid, probably the first thing your teacher said was, pull your stomach in. Yeah, pull in, pull in, pull in. And so dancers almost have this sort of Pavlovian conditioning that as soon as they step into a dance studio, everything goes in and up. So they lock their abdom abdominal muscles inwards. So this is going to affect their ability to get that subglottal pressure. You can all experiment with this. If you, for one moment, suck your abdomen in, pull your belly button towards your spine, and try and take a really deep breath. You find you meet a lot of resistance and you're not really able to fill um, the lungs adequately. If you then release the abdomen, take another breath in and allow that abdominal wall to expand, then we've got our big uh, full tank of air to get um, the breath in. So dancers are, are predisposed with the way they're using their bodies to not have enough subglottal pressure, which only leaves them the option of that constriction method to get the sound. And this is why we see them getting a lot of um, vocal uh, issues. So why are they doing that? Why are they trained to do that? Well, historically, in dance training, we have to remember, is all about tradition. You guys probably are more uh, familiar with the sports world where everything's evidence-based. We look at the science and the sports physiology that all you guys are doing to help us uh, uh, get training methods. Dance is still very steeped in tradition. And it was thought that we got our stability from sucking the abs in, where you'd suck everything in and, and you hold on, and then you're going to be on balance. So dancers would typically, when they balance, bring the abs in and hold their breath. <gasps> Not very useful if you've got to sing at that point. So what it's about is actually changing what we're doing in the dance class to facilitate better stability. Because if I suck my breath in and hold that balance like this, if someone comes and nudges me, I'm just going to go <laughs> over. I'm just going to keel over like a concrete block. Balance, as we know, and stability is about adapt adaptation. It's about being able to make micro adjustments. If you allow your uh, balances to be formed on an exhale, 
you get a much, much more stable uh, balance because the transversus abdominis that's doing most of the work there is a perfect core stabilizer. It also means that you can actually adapt as you're balancing. It lowers your center of gravity because you're not having all this tension in the upper chest. And then if you need to be singing, well, you're already breathing out, so you don't have to change anything. At the moment, dancers feel like they have to reinvent the wheel when they start singing, and it, for them, it's like patting their bellies and rubbing their heads because it's, it's turning upside down everything that they've been trained to do. So this issue is more about training dancers to breathe correctly to facilitate their dancing, but also so that there isn't this big kind of leap uh, when they have to come into to vocalizing. So other things these performers have to do, they might be flying in a harness, and those things restrict your breath as well. The Lion King with those crazy headdresses puts massive vector forces on the neck. It's um, really, really changing center of gravity and balance. They might be on skates in uh, Starlight Express, and they're going at incredible speeds around the track in that show. Beauty and the Beast, the wardrobe, that, that, that costume is made of plywood. It is heavy, and they can't take it off. Once they put it on at the start of the show, they're in it because it takes too long to get in and out. So these, these performers have a lot uh, being thrown at them all the time, and their cardiovascular requirements are very, very high. But are we training them to do that? And the answer is not very well. And all the studies that have been done looking at, at the aerobic capacity of dancers, who you'd think are very, very fit, they actually perform very poorly, particularly with regard to athletes, and in some studies, even against the general population. The reason being is that dance training, dance class, is very anaerobic. It's short burst activity. You do a combination, and then you wait until everybody else in the class has done it, and then you do a little bit more. Then they get into a show, and suddenly it's endurance. They haven't trained like for like. So we need to be looking at supplemental training uh, for, the, for these artists. And again, it's not historically uh, been done in training. The dance programs, they normally start classes at 9.30, 10 in the morning. They run till about 5 or 6. Then they go into rehearsals for whatever show they're doing at the time or their choreographic stuff. They're often working till 10, 11, 12 at night. And you say to them, you need to be doing supplemental training. And they go, well, when do I do that? How do I fit that in my schedule? So we really, what we're working on is looking at um, dance curriculum um, and looking at well we need to build that in for them we need to or at least give them the space to be able to do it and actually take more from what we know from the sports literature and apply it to what's happening in dance so uh, lots and lots of different issues that this population is faced with training historically is not really supporting it and when you look at how a rehearsal processes run for these performers as well. You tend to have um, all the dance is done in one studio, all the voice training is done in another studio, and then in about week two of rehearsals, they then say, oh, put that together again, put that together, and you just have to get on with it. You just have to figure out, well, now I'm down like this when I'm supposed to be singing that note, how do I do it? Um, so we also need to look at choreographers and musical directors and how they're actually creating these productions and are they actually doing it in a way that's sympathetic to the challenges that these performers face. So a lot of work needs to be done in our field. We need the sports uh, physiology research to, to support us in that. Um, and together we can make life a little safer for our performers. And most shows uh, finish with a grand finale, a big number, so I've brought you a chorus line there to just finish off with the top hats and say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for the chorus line. <laughs> of course. So we have a question from Reagan Swaim from Tarleton State University. Do you think dance can move away from traditional training methods in order to improve better quality? I think just need to expand a little bit on what you were talking about, new training types. Yes, I mean, it, it's hard. It's hard because there's a lot of resistance to it. People are saying, well, we've always done it this way. It's never been a problem before. But we're looking at the type of shows these artists are needing to do today. Everything's moved on. So the audiences are used to going to the movie theater and seeing CGI and all these crazy things. So theatrical performances are becoming grander and more elaborate, and the artists are required to do so much more than they used to. So the training has got to shift to match that. And right now, it's starting, but it's very slow. We're at the very early stages of it, and we are encountering some resistance. So, and I'll come back to the resistance in a little bit. So I have a question here from Kenneth here in College Station. 
Um, and I think he's referring to when you were talking about this, this the people who are trying to be triple threats that mm -hmm. maybe haven't trained as well. What kind of what's the most common injury that you're seeing amongst these dancers when they're trying to do all this? Yeah, so dancers are tending to come in with more of the vocal injuries mm -hmm. because the dance stuff they're kind of happy with, they're trained for, but it's the vocalizations we've seen, they haven't got the right um, air support to be able to do that. Um, therefore, we're seeing the vocal injuries coming from them. Then from the singers, we if they're suddenly in a show that's got a fair amount of choreography that they've got to be a part of, they don't necessarily have the core stability training to be able to manage that or the flexibility. So they're coming in with the hip, lower back, mm. knee, muscle strain problems. So it's really the area where they're, they're not particularly trained in as well. Yeah, they're whatever their weakness is. Yeah. Um, sorry, we're not, I'm not going to ask that question. Okay. <laughs> I'm intrigued now. Um, Apologize. Uh, when do you think the shift in training would be most impactful? Would that be something that you'd consider doing in young dancers or mostly at the advanced levels? Just well, from I from Chelsea G. Okay. Uh, I think, I mean, it depends what you're talking about or what they're training towards. If you're just looking at somebody going, a young kid going to ballet class or something, I think we should be changing the breath issue mm. in, in dance anyway, just because it's, it's useful for, for the dancing, as regardless of whether they're going to sing or not. And then if they do then want to make that transition, they don't have to reinvent the wheel to do it. But it's more about if you're, if you're, if you're creating a training program that is, we are training musical theater performers, or we are training circus artists or whatever, that it needs to be specific. And at the moment, everyone still does these very traditional style classes and then tries to sort of fit triangles into squares and, and make things work um, rather than really making the training fit for purpose. How do you overcome the resistance? You men mentioned that a while ago. <sighs> With a lot of diplomacy and not trying to feel like, you know, a lot of teachers feel they're under attack. I go out to talk to quite a lot of, of educators and normally you go in and they're like this because they're like, don't tell, me I'm d don't tell me I've got to go back to my students and say everything we've been doing is wrong. So it's just saying it's not about right or wrong. It's about we now have more information than we had. We're now uh, are asking our artists to do a lot more than we used to ask them to do. These guys are doing eight shows a week and they might be in that show for two, three years. You know, they need to be, be trained to do that. And it didn't, they didn't historically, that outcome wasn't uh, the same, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. So um, it's about just saying we've got to move with the times and that we need to take, you know, examples from the sports world and say they're using evidence based. Nothing happens in training without uh, an evidence base behind it we should be doing the same because we have a duty of care that we have a 95% injury prevalence rate in dancers. You know, some studies anywhere from 75 to 95%. That's not good enough. So that's a great take home message. Let's use some sports in examples, right? Of course. Right. Please join me in thanking Ms. Morton. Thank you. Thanks.